The, the title of his presentation is uh, Violence and Realism in the Prince. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I first wanted to thank um, the organizers of the conference for uh, um, inviting me and for making this event possible. It's a great um, honor and opportunity to be here and I'm very excited um, to participate in this um, uh, great event. So thank you very much. To read the prints is, as Claude Lefort has taught us, to read the history of the book's interpretations. The discourse of Machiavelli's interpreters weighs, to borrow Marx's formulation, like a nightmare on the brains of the living. Or in Lefort's less dramatic words, it invests us. Nous sommes investis par lui. But it is not only as belated readers, as nachgeborene, so to speak, that we are beholden to the history of interpretations. It is also through the specializations of academic knowledge production. The disciplinary appropriations of Machiavelli that invest us, and again in Lefort's words, demand tribute from us. My tribute today is to the reception of Machiavelli as a political scientist, and more specifically, to the problem of violence and realism in the prints. In a sense, then, I'm going to examine what Skinner has called the textbook view of Machiavelli, but I do so, to my defense, perhaps, to clarify the ways in which Machiavelli's theorizing about violence challenges the premises ingrained in late modern readers. It may even be the case that in the process we will gain a better understanding of why the textbook view continues to have such currency. Machiavelli is sometimes credited for being the first author in the canon of Western political theory who candidly discusses the role of violence in politics. Machiavelli is also frequently described as belonging to the tradition of political realism, even though there is, of course, a well-established tradition of interpretation that sees him as a utopian. I'm thinking of Gicciardini, Chabot, Sasso, and so on and so forth. As we know, violence and the threat thereof are central modes of realist statecraft. It would thus stand to reason that violence is central to Machiavelli insofar as he is a realist, or that Machiavelli's association with the realist tradition explains the centrality of violence to his thinking. Now the thesis I would like to advance today is that this inference is a fallacy and that Machiavelli's reflections on political violence are unhelpfully obscured by the lens of political realism. To be sure, comparative, qualitative, and quantitative analysis of violence in Machiavelli's text is part of a larger cultural transformation in the depiction of violence in 14th to 16th century Europe, as well as a local response to the historical situation of Italy post-1494. Whereas figuration, though certainly not practices of cruelty and violence, are remarkably absent from early and central medieval culture, by the turn of the 16th century, cruelty becomes a central cultural topos. Representation of cruelty become more prevalent, more explicit, more effective, and more detailed. War, cruelty, and violence are no longer figured simply in terms of good and evil. Violence, instead, is objectified and quantified it becomes the object of a new realism in painting, of detailed and accurate descriptions, of theatrical enactment in Elizabethan drama, at the same time as war emerges as a burgeoning new field of study. Now, violence in the prints. Machiavelli considered violence and terror to be essential in the formation of a new political regime. Not only new princes, but also founders of republics must deploy violence to secure new political institutions. While violence is not the only mode in which power is created, in the print it is figured as indispensable. And Machiavelli cites numerous historical and mythical examples of princes who eliminated their rivals, assassinated their subordinates, expropriated land and residences, and destroyed entire cities. In the discourses, Machiavelli calls such tactics very cruel and inimical to every way of life, not only Christian, but human. Hence his recommendation to avoid them and 
to live in private rather than as king. Yet those unwilling to heed his advice must enter into this evil. The same expression, entrare nel male, is used in chapter 18 of The Prince, where Machiavelli writes that a prince needs to know how to enter into evil when forced by necessity. Sapere entrare nel malo necessitato. In the very same paragraph, Machiavelli says that a prince who wishes to maintain his state is forced by necessity, again, necessitato, to act against faith, against charity, against humanity, against religion. Necessity thus appears to be one of the ways in which certain types of excess, violence, fraud, heresy, cruelty, and evil are rationalized. A prince's breach of norms, it would seem, is often sforzato or necessitato, suggesting that a prince's violence is a response to political reality. Chapter 19 confirms that, quote, a prince who wants to maintain his state is often forced not to be good. And chapter 21 delivers the argument of the lesser evil by insisting that, quote, prudence consists in picking the less bad as good. This line of argument is, of course, familiar from the tradition of political realism. Now, I take realism to be a discursive tradition that emerges in late 16th and early 17th centuries from the convergence of two theoretical developments. First, the rediscovery of Tacitus and the spread of Neo-Tacitism, and second, the emergence of raison d'etat as a theoretical and political problem. Now there's of course significant variation within the realist school of political theory, if we can even speak of such a school, from the 16th century counter-reformation authors such as Giovanni Botero to 17th century theorists of royal absolutism to 18th century counter-revolutionaries and to 19th century German Staatswissenschaften culminating in the work of Max Weber. But broadly speaking, I think there are four features that make realist political theory distinctive and that are also shared by Machiavelli. First, a moral psychology that emphasizes the role of passions and emotions. Second, the rejection of moralism and what is today called ideal theory. Third, the recognition of conflict as an essential and structuring feature of the political field. And fourth, a focus on political actions and on institutions as the sites that sustain and reproduce political actions rather than on political beliefs and opinions. You'll note that I do not include here sort of some of the conventional claims about political realism according to which it is based on a particular um, philosophical anthropology that sees uh, certain, forms of, um, certain forms of evil or self-interest to be at the center of um, human nature. And while the place of Machiavelli in that tradition is complicated and controversial, after all, 16th and 17th century neo-tacitists rarely cited him, the counter-reformation critics of Ragion di Stato attacked him as a heretic, and the Machiavelli scholarship of the past 60 years has pretty much demolished the idea of Machiavelli as the founder of a modern, secular, rationalist, and post-humanist form of political analysis. By the 19th, and certainly by the early 20th century, Machiavelli was, by and large, absorbed into this discursive tradition and became a key figure of authority for the realist theory of the state. Thus, from Fichte's 1807 essay, Über Machiavelli als Schriftsteller, to E.H. Carr's description of Machiavelli as the first important political realist, readers have approached Machiavelli through the moral dilemma of how to legitimate the necessary means for the preservation or change of political realities. Now what do political realists, what does the realist tradition of political theory have to say about violence? To the extent that we can speak of a realist theory of political violence, such a theory tends to treat violence as an inescapable feature of the political. Realists tend to regard violence as first instrumental and second a product of nature. First, realists understand violence primarily through a means and logic formulated most cogently by Max Weber 
who defined violence as the specific means, the spezifische Mittel of the modern state, subject to calculations of instrumental rationality, violence, in Hannah Arendt's words, always stands in need of guidance and justification through the end it pursues. And second, realists take violence to be a fundamental element of the human condition, an anthropological datum that can at best be checked, contained, and controlled, but cannot ultimately be overcome. This conception of violence is typically supplemented by a normative theory of natural right, according to which violence, qua product of nature, is a legitimate means to pursue just ends. Because they consider violence a residual instrument of nature, realists tend to endorse, subject to various conditions, provisos, and qualifications, the use of violence for the pursuit of political purposes. To the extent that this logic gives shape to a coherent realist political theory, it relies, as Walter Benjamin notes, on the premise that actors have a de jure right to use at will, and I'm quoting, to use at will the violence that is de facto at their disposal. To what extent does this realist theory of violence capture Machiavelli's thinking, and how persuasive is this framework to account for Machiavelli's work on violence? Does Machiavelli, as Richard Tuck puts it, just, quote, simply put very clearly something which had always been present in the Roman texts. Namely, the need for a city to use relatively unscrupulous violence in the pursuit of liberty and glory. In what follows, I would, briefly, I would like to briefly chart out two dimensions of violence in the prints that are poorly captured by this realist framework. So violence beyond realism. When realists discuss violence as one among multiple means to pursue particular political ends, they typically have the coercive model of violence in mind. Coercion is the application of violence, or the threat thereof, by one agent to another. It is a dyadic model that involves the use of violence to force an agent to do something, or abstain from doing something, against their will. The locus classicus for this model of violence is Clausewitz, who defines war as, quote, an act of force to compel our enemy to do our will. Thus, for Clausewitz, war is, quote, nothing but a duel on a larger scale. My claim is that Machiavelli's understanding of violence differs significantly from this dyadic picture in three important respects. First, violence in the prince is not only an instrument, but also a signifier. Second, Violence for Machiavelli is not a sufficient means, but one that is mediated by the passions, above all, love and fear. And third, the model of political violence is not dyadic, but triadic. Violence is effective not because it addresses another agent who is thus coerced. Rather, violence constitutes an address, an appeal to an audience. Let me say a few sentences about each of these three. First, violence is a signifier. By this, I mean that violence in the prince signifies the break with the past, the challenge to tradition and to hereditary forms of legitimacy that the new prince embodies. As you know, in the prince, political violence is first introduced as a necessary strategy for the new prince. Political power, Machiavelli informs his reader in the first chapter of the prince, is acquired either by heredity or by conquest. Because the hereditary, or the so-called natural prince, has less need to recourse to violence, it is fitting that he be more loved. The new prince, deprived of this love that the hereditary prince inspires, must instead rely on extraordinary and excessive force to establish his state, entrench his power, and secure his dominion. Hence, the new prince is advised to raise the entire social order and, in the, works, in the words of Discourses 126, make everything anew, including new governments with new names, new authorities, new men. Paradoxically, the destruction wrought by the new prince generates a substitute for hereditary legitimacy. It ratifies the prince's implicit claim that the past is irretrievably gone and that a new age 
has begun. Following Le Faux, we might say that there is an imaginary component to this novelty. And within that imaginary, violence functions not merely as an instrument, but as an analog for the novelty that is the hallmark of a political foundation. Second, violence is mediated by the passions. Violence produces political effects not by forcing someone to do something against their will, but by stimulating the passions. The new prince's violence has two immediate effects. It eliminates political rivals and supporters of the old order, for example, Borgia's assassination of the condottieri at Sinigalia on New Year's Day 1503, but it also leaves behind a residual memory of violence, a latent fear that becomes a political resource. Fear, as chapter 17 argues, is the most potent political passion and it is the one that is most obviously engendered by violence. But violence can also produce love or its relatives, admiration, gratitude, awe, as is evidenced by Borgia's execution of Ramiro de Orco, narrated in chapter seven and masterfully analyzed by John McCormick. The execution, dismemberment, and public display of Ramiro's body become a cathartic moment, even though the Duke was reputed cruel, Machiavelli adds in chapter 17, his cruelty restored Raconcia de Romagna. This restoration is described in the same terminology as the violence of that other favorite founder figure, Romulus. In Discourses 1-9, Machiavelli justifies the legendary fratricide that founded Rome as an act of restoring and reordering, Raconciare. The public spettacolo of violence in uh, The Prince leaves the people satisfied and stupefied. Note that it is the ferocity of the spectacle. In other words, the public display of excessive violence, the excess, the surplus of violence beyond the retribution that fulfills this political role. De Orco's violation of bodies and limits generates a socialized effective response, hatred, which in turn is converted into a political resource by another transgression, the gruesome display of the violated violator. The torture beyond death and its public staging, after all, um, Borgia had him placed in the piazza at Cesena in two pieces with the piece of wood and the bloody knife beside him, produced the satisfaction for the audience, the, the purging of the spirits. This excess turned spectacular violence into a remedial force with therapeutic effects, strong medicine, as Machiavelli calls it elsewhere. It restores, repairs, and reorders a point Machiavelli signals to the repeated use of the term raconciare. In the De Orco episode, the political objective is not to eliminate a rival or coerce a resistant population, but to exploit the semiotic dimension of violence and employ violence in the production of signs and subjectivities. This brings me to my third point, that violence here does not follow the dyadic model of coercion, but operates as a communicative strategy. When violence is deployed as a communicative strategy, the strategic objective is to reach an audience beyond the victim, a third party that is not directly injured by the violent act. The appeal to the audience is an appeal to what rhetoricians call pathos, tapping emotions and affect as a political resource. In contrast to the coercive model, including the Clausewitzian uh, version of the duel, violence here relies on appearance and visibility. Violence, in short, calls for a phenomenology, and part of that phenomenology is the analysis of how violence appeals to the political passions. Indeed, the passions play a critical mediating function in order to render violence effective. We might even say that in the Machiavellian text, it is the interplay of the passions that operate the rationalization of violence. Contrary to most realists, Machiavelli's logic of the political passions involves not only fear, but also love and hatred. Hatred is especially dangerous to the prince because it will lead to conspiracies and revolts against his rule. This, of course, is precisely what makes it so useful to rebels and revolutionaries, as the 
anonymous wool carder in the Florentine histories reminds us. Machiavelli's logic of the passions is a dialectical arrangement, for fear is always on the brink of turning into hatred, and hatred can also turn into fear. It is in this framework that the communicative strategy of violence finds its political place. Fear and hatred are the internal limits of the spectacularization of violence. They point, the point at which fear turns into hatred marks the internal limit of violence efficacy. Yet in the spectacular form, violence may convert this hatred into satisfaction, pleasure, perhaps even love. When hatred can be converted into fear or love, it is transformed from a liability into a political resource. So let me get to a few concluding remarks. In sum, violence for Machiavelli is not an infinitely transposable political instrument, but a contextually specific rhetorical strategy. The claim, most explicitly formulated by Tuck, that violence, quote, uh, excuse me, that Machiavelli, quote, simply put very clearly something which had been obvious at least since Tacitus, therefore strikes me as unconvincing. If the prince ratifies the theme of a political order based on violence, its analysis remains tied to a concrete political conjuncture, defined by the political and military crisis of Italian states. To theorize this crisis requires, as Jean-Louis Fournel and Jean-Claude Zancarini have reminded us, new ways of speaking about politics and history. I started my presentation today with two claims. First, that violence is central to the prince, and second, that Machiavelli is part of the realist tradition of political theory. Surely, the first claim is uncontroversial. And while the second one will no doubt be subject to some dispute here, I continue to regard it as plausible, subject to some qualifications, of course. Yet in combination, these two claims yield, I think, a confused and inaccurate account of Machiavelli's thinking on violence. When we yoke Machiavelli's theory of violence to issues such as the relation of ethics and politics, the problems of means and ends, deontological versus consequentialist ethical theories, and so on, we read Machiavelli through the lens of Weber, and such a reading comes at a cost. While realists such as Weber are eager to claim Machiavelli for their political projects, Machiavelli's text continues to resist such an absorption. Conscious of this friction, Maurizio Viroli recently proposed that Machiavelli's realism is best understood as a realism with imagination. Such a realism, Viroli insists, is immune to the epistemic fallacies of a vulgar empiricism because it does not presume that political reality manifests itself fully and transparently. In short, a realism with imagination differs from your garden variety realism, not only because it acknowledges the role of the imagination in politics, and so the ability to envisage alternative political arrangements than the hegemonic <laughs> ones, but also because it underscores the importance of interpretation. Political reality does not manifest itself in the form of a self-identical positivity, but requires the labor of interpretation in order to be unveiled. I think Viroli is right to emphasize the imagination, as indeed many interpreters of Machiavelli have. Yet I don't find the formulation of a realism with imagination ultimately persuasive. For one, the prominence of interpretation in Machiavelli's corpus has as its counterpart a profound investment in the literary and rhetorical tradition that has historically been poorly understood by those who assimilate Machiavelli to a form of secular political analysis. Political reality is not simply unveiled through interpretive labor. This unveiling itself is a rhetorical trope, and the relation between realism and imagination is not one of partial assimilation as a formulation of, uh, as the relation between realism, as the formulation of a realism with imagination suggests. But instead, I think it is a profoundly dialectical one. The hypothesis that suggests itself is thus that the emphasis on the verità effettuale announces not a more realistic perspective on politics, but rather, as Vicky Kahn has proposed, a more profoundly rhetorical politics, 
that even the humanist tradition had envisaged. Perhaps rhetorical realism would be a better fit, or imaginary realism. Or we could approach Filippo de Lucchese's formulation of a radical realism. Etienne Balibar has raised the question of violence's convertibility. That is, the conversion of violence into political institutions, into law, or into modes of power or rationality. A problem that Balibar has approached through a reading of Hobbes and Hegel, and that has also been taken up by Vittorio Morfino in his book on Hegel and violence. Such a conversion or convertibility, Balibar writes, is a central philosophical schema of rationalizing political violence. Borrowing Balibar's concept, I would argue that Machiavellian violence is eminently convertible, not obviously in the historico-philosophical sense that such conversions acquire in 19th century German idealism and the history of Marxism, but as a rhetorical practice. One might indeed reformulate the Machiavellian criterion to the effect that cruelty well used is cruelty that is convertible, a conversion that is operated by the trilogy of the political passions and is underwritten by a rhetorical and semiotic conception of violence. Thank you. Thank you very much. So there are questions. We have uh, 15 minutes. So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask you a little bit more at the end because I was wondering where in your paper uh, the law comes in, right? And then at the very end, uh, you brought it in. So I wanted to uh, hear more about how you think really the relationship between violence and uh, uh, law in, in Machiavelli is, uh, is uh, formulated, right? In other words, um, it's true that later, in, for example, in German, Gewalt is a term that is equiprimordial between law and violence, yeah? Uh, so in a way, violence is always law-making and law-conserving, as Benjamin says. So I'm wondering, is, is that what you see in Machiavelli, or, or, or do you see the relation between violence and law differently? Thank you. Um, differently, to be sure. Uh, in, I mean, in, in, there is no... There's certainly no law positing violence in Machiavelli in the sense of uh, the Beniminian version of, of, of Rechtsetzung. Um, I mean, there is, I would argue that um, it, it is the, the other term that, Machiavelli, that, that Benjamin uses, which is the Machtsetzende Gewalt, the, the, the violence that creates power that is at work in Machiavelli, um, but not so much the one that creates um, the one that creates law. Now, there are instances in, um, in the discourses where, um, where the law is, where, where laws are established through violence, but I, I don't see, I don't see the, um, the universal conception of law um, in, uh, in the prints. I don't see the Machiavellian notion of political order that is um, in, envisaged in the, the formulation of lo stato as one that um, is best captured by the, by the normative logic of the law that um, you know, then plays itself out in, um, in modernity. So I mean, I would, I would go with a much more local understanding of, of laws um, as ones that are, that, are, that are made and unmade. And so in that sense, um, violence has a, has a local function and precisely that it can um, produce certain forms of political legitimacy and produce certain conditions for particular laws to be um, effective and or palatable. Um, but I would not, um, I, I think the, um, the sort of like the Benjaminian version of um, of Rechtsetzung is not um, is not one that I think is quite um, applicable to uh, uh, to to the prince. Ah, this is. Uh, thank you, Eve. That was a, a wonderful paper. Um, I think you decimate the 
other side, the instrumental view of violence in Machiavelli. But I wonder if in the paper, do you differentiate kinds of violence in Machiavelli? Because it, it seems to be, Machiavelli has preferences for kinds of violence. So for instance, Cesare Borgia, you used the Ramiro incident, and that's a kind of violence that Machiavelli prefers. But Cesare Borgia acting as a papal mercenary strangles uh, the other mercenaries at the other condottieri at uh, Senegalia. Livarotto strangles the first men of Fenimo in private. Th these seem to be kinds of violence Machiavelli disapproves of as opposed to the publicness of Ramiro's two, two bodies, if you, if you will. Uh, the publicness of Clearchus and Agathocles killing the Senate and richest citizens before the people. So I'm wondering if in the paper, do you distinguish between kinds of violence in Machiavelli? So in, um, thank you, John. Um, in this paper, I don't, but um, in the larger project, uh, I do. And I think it's an important um, one. I mean, you, you raised the question of the public versus the, the private or the, the, the visible um, versus the, um, the concealed, and I think that is an important aspect precisely because of the, the way that violence functions as a public performance and produces particular appeals to an audience through its, through its visibility. So obviously the, um, the hidden violence doesn't quite have the same function um, as, the, um, as the public one. Plus, I think what the, um, the example both of uh, um, Agathocles and um, end of Borgia in, in the Diorco story um, shows is, is the way in which um, uh, certain forms of um, violence perpetrated against, um, against the, the powerful, against the ultimati, um, or against, uh, um, in, the case of, in the case of Diorco, against those who are, um, have violated the people, the oppressors, um, uh, can generate uh, political, political legitimacy. And I think that is, um, that, that is an important, um, an important dimension, dimension of it. There is, a, I think, there's also the, the, the class dimension, um, of course, which is that um, the, the kinds of violence that uh, um, that Machiavelli seems to approve of is always the um, the violence against uh, uh, against the grand. I mean, it's not the um, it's, it's not the violence uh, against the popolo. Those forms of uh, um, public unrest um, are always described uh, in, in in negative terms throughout the world. Okay, uh, thank you for your paper. I found very stimulating the, 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 uh, when, when you talk about, uh, about the, the idea of violence as a communicative strategy. And I would like to, to pose it, connect it with, with the last things you say about the, the, the uh, convert, com, yeah, to be convertible of the, the violence into institutions. And just, just uh, uh, connecting to the, the last things you said, I was wondering if, uh, how important is it in order to uh, find to, to, to the, the, the violence convertible into institutions to consider that this uh, communicative strategy, strategy is always bidirectional since not only the prince uh, uses uh, violence on his subjects in order to produce fear but also at least potentially subjects uh, uses uh, a potential violence uh, in order to make fear, to, the, uh, to, to create some fear in the prince uh, and to direct his uh, communicative strategies, politics of patience uh, towards love better than, uh, rather than towards uh, hate. Uh, and so not only the discourses where, the, 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 as you told, the, 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 the tumults and the clash of is, is uh, but also in the prince there is this bidirectional uh, communication of violence, at least potential, at least uh, which is a, a fundamental uh, is a tool in order to um, stabilize and to convert violence into institutions. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, think, it's, I think it's right that it's bidirectional, but um, I, I don't think that the, um, I think the, the violence that the, the people may exercise, that may be exercised against, print is always mediated by the people. And I think that, that, that is an important, a very important point that we, we learned from Machiavelli, that um, the, the ultimate um, political base of a successful prince is the people. It's not uh, the, 
princes do not, do not govern, they, do not be, they are not able to hold on to their state just through military means. They, they need the popular support, and so the, the, the effectiveness, potential disturbance um, that violence, uh, popular violence can cause is not so much because it creates fear in a prince, but because it erodes the popular support on which, um, um, on which prince's success is ultimately uh, must ultimately be based. So, um, but I think that's right, and that in, in, except that it, the, the mediation through the through the people, people which again filtered through the through the political passions, I think is um, is central here. Me, yeah. Thanks, Eve. Uh, following John's question, I was also wondering if you distinguish between different kind of fears, uh, in the sense that uh, it seems to me. Uh, there's room to see fear not so much as a passion, insofar as it is distinguished or something else from reason, but rather in Machiavelli between uh, reasonable fears and unreasonable fears, what uh, eventually in the late 16th and 17th century will be called superstition, for example, right? Someone like Spinoza, fear of God is, some, is an expression that is meaningless. Now, it seems to me that Machiavelli is seeing something there when he points out all the uh, historical examples where people uh, should fear something, and in fact, they do not, or, or the other way around. And it works in a very complicated way. I mean, Cesare Borgia didn't fear the election of the Pope della Rovere and ruined. The Pope didn't fear the Baglioni, and he succeeded. Uh, so it's very complicated, and I was wondering if you see room to, to anticipate this kind of discourse that will become central later on. That's a great question. Um, that's a great question. I, I, you're right. You're, I think you're putting your finger on something that I, I, I need to do. Um, I have to think about this more in more detail, but just as a sort of a first response, um, I think we need to distinguish two different aspects. One is the, um, the failure to foresee something. So that the, that's the, the, the Borja's problem in the failure of um, foreseeing the consequences of the, um, the new pope, the Delarover Pope and the effect it's going to have on um, his state in the uh, Romania and, 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 and so on. And then the other thing is the, um, the sort of the, the irrational fears that it can be, um, that can be used strategically, right? So um, uh, various formulations in, um, in the discourses, especially where, um, you know, the strategic use of religion um, becomes a way to inspire um, such irrational fears as um, Ways making it them politically effective, um, but but I will have to think more about it. I think it's a, I think it's a good question. I think it's a good point that um, I need to address. Okay, Thomas. Oui, merci. Uh, je voulais ajouter simplement peut-être un, un, un quatrième argument aux trois trois arguments que tu as mentionné contre le réalisme, uh, qui serait uh, le fait que que ce soit dans, dans le chapitre 8 du Prince ou dans le, dans les, le chapitre 26-27 des discours, euh, Machiavel s'attache toujours aussi à, à défaire, hein, à dénouer véritablement la possibilité qu'on aurait à euh, réfléchir euh, l'usage du mal euh, en tentant d'établir en quelque sorte une juste mesure, un usage modéré, euh, une voie du milieu, même, dit-il, entre le bien et le mal, quand il critique, euh, par exemple, la posture de Baglioni, euh, dans, dans, dans le chapitre 27, je crois, euh, pour, au contraire, faire l'éloge de, 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 de cet usage un peu excessif, euh, euh, radical, immédiat, en quelque sorte, de la cruauté, dont il reconnaît ensuite qu'elle est euh, bien plus généreuse, donc, hein, bien plus honorable, je crois, comme il le dit dans le texte. Euh, voilà. Il me semble que là aussi, cette, cette, cette critique qui fait d'une d'un usage modéré du mal, hein, qui est, euh, serait propre à cette espèce d'instrumentalisation du mal de la tradition réaliste, comme s'il s'agissait d'élever véritablement ce, 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 ce réalisme radical contre un, un, une forme de radical, une forme de, de, de réalisme trop, 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 trop coincé dans l'instrumentalisation du mal. Quelque chose de ce genre. Merci. Euh, oui, je, je suis d'accord dans de la mesure où enfin, l'instrumentalisation du mal, évidemment, elle est, elle est... Elle est importante euh, dans le prince, euh, mais, euh, mais l'idée qu'on qu puisse la doser de la façon comme, par exemple, euh, euh, Wallin l'a proposé dans son, euh, 
fameuse euh, euh, parole d'une économie de la violence. Ça, je suis, suis d'accord que c'est... Euh, je ne suis, suis pas sûr que, que, que ce, ce genre de, de dosage précis euh, est, est vraiment envisagé euh, par Machiavel, ni dans le prince, évidemment non, dans les, les discours. Je dirais la dernière question, et après on passe à la prochaine. Oui, euh, je ne voulais pas parler de ça, mais je rebondis sur ce que tu viens de dire. Je ne crois pas que c'est une question de dosage, c'est une question de temps. Il y a un temps pour le mal, il y a un temps pour la violence. Et euh, c'est cette question du temps, donc c'est la question de la conjoncture dans laquelle on peut avoir recours à la violence qui compte pour Machiavel. Et alors bon, on peut dire que c'est du réalisme ou que c'est pas du réalisme, peu importe. Je veux dire, euh, ce, qui, ce qui importe là, c'est la qualité des temps. Et de ce point de vue-là, je pense qu'il faut aussi faire un travail de distinction, si on veut faire une typologie euh, un peu solide, euh, entre différents termes qui ne recouvrent pas exactement les mêmes références. C'est-à-dire, quand Machiavel parle de violence, c'est pas la même chose que quand il parle de crudelta, c'est pas la même chose que quand il parle de, de force, et quand il parle de violence, il en parle à un moment donné extrêmement précis, qui est au début du chapitre 9, quand il parle de intolérable violence. Hein euh, et et, et c'est le moment le, le plus fort, c'est le moment le plus lourd, euh, au tout début du chapitre 9, Hein euh, et euh, c'est un moment qui, qui, ne, qui ne revient pas et, et là dessus aussi il y a quelque chose qui à mon avis euh, serait intéressant pour, pour ton travail de typologie c'est d'essayer de repartir aussi de la façon dont apparaît cette question de la violence ou de la force dans le texte du prince ça apparaît pas n'importe comment C'est-à-dire, ça apparaît par une sorte d'auto-engendrement du texte lui-même bon, moi je pense que ce n'était pas prévu au départ voilà. C'est-à-dire que euh, au départ, il ne, il ne nous parle pas du contenu ni du chapitre 8 ni du chapitre 9. C'est le contenu du chapitre 7 qui le force à poser la question qu'il va poser dans le chapitre 8. Parce que effectivement, il y a des exercices de la force ou de la violence en politique qui ne relèvent pas de ce dont il a parlé avec César Borgia. Et donc, il va être obligé de parler de ce cas spécifique, d'échelle à la tête, c'est un autre terme pour parler de cela. C'est-à-dire qu'on a une rosa, dit Hermini, autour de cette question, qui permet justement, à mon avis, d'en de, faire une, une cartographie précise, et peut-être qu'on doit partir d'ici. Et à cet égard, à mon avis, il est utile de repartir plutôt du matériel qu'il avait à sa disposition quand il essaye de réfléchir là-dessus plutôt que de ce que euh, on a pu après euh, faire comme discours euh, au 19e ou 20e siècle sur euh, euh, la, la question du lien entre violence et pouvoir euh, de, 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 différentes, de différents ordres. Et qu'est-ce qu que c'est la formation de Machiavel sur cette question La formation de Machiavel, c'est que c'est un type qui a entendu quelqu'un qui s'appelle Savonarole et qui disait euh, que dans son traité, au début du troisième livre de son traité, que pour ce qui concernait l'usage de la force pour la prise du pouvoir, eh bien, il n'en parlerait pas, parce que c'est échappé à la raison. Donc, le, le, le problème de Machiavel, c'est très clair, c'est que lui, il doit euh, inventer, il doit combler ce vide, cette béance, ce trou, qui est pointé par Savonarole. Et euh, à partir de là, euh, je pense que c'est aussi là-dessus là qu'il réfléchit. Donc, euh, la question des, de la violence, ou la question des chélaratesses et des crueltas, elle existe par rapport à cette autre question qui les chapeaute tous, qui est le rapport entre la force et la raison. Et c'est une façon d'ailleurs de, de repenser le rapport euh, loi-arme, parce que euh, moi je, je, je ne crois pas euh, que... Euh, enfin, il me semble que chez Machiavel, il y a, il y a un lien qui est, qui est évident entre l'exercice le, euh, de la loi et l'exercice de la force. C'est évident. Les, les deux n'ont pas ça. Alors donc, à partir de là, je, 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 ça me paraît... Il y avait une formulation que tu utilisais tout à l'heure euh, qui me semblait qui m'a un peu surprise là-dessus, parce que j'ai l'impression que tu dissociais clairement les deux, mais peut-être que j'ai mal compris. Donc voilà, excuse-moi, c'est juste un codicile à, à nos débats. Le, le, fin, le fin de tout ce que tu disais, j'ai mal compris euh, la formulation euh, euh, que, que tu as surprise, c'était laquelle Bon. Ouais, ouais. bon, il y a beaucoup là, ce que, de, ce que tu, tu me donnes là comme commentaire, c'est très utile. Bon, il y a, il y a, il y a plusieurs, il y a plusieurs questions. 
pour, pour Savonarole, je suis d'accord que... Euh, qu'il faut comprendre le prince comme réaction à Savonarole. Évidemment, c'est pour ça qu'il y a la formulation du, du prophète euh, armé. Ça, c'est clairement une, une référence. Et, et, et à partir de ça, de penser l'effectivité de la violence, ça me semble, ça me semble essentiel. Pour euh, la question, si on peut faire une cartographie de la violence par rapport au, te, euh, au terme utilisé par Machiavel, euh, je ne suis pas sûr. Ça, j'ai essayé et je ne suis pas convaincu que les termes de « violenza »,« crueltà »,« forza »,« scelatessa euh, » recouvrent euh, des, des, des concepts spécifiques et bien différenciés. Je pense plutôt qu'il s'agit d'une constellation de termes euh, qui décrivent euh, des, des concepts, peut-être pas un concept, mais des, des, des concepts euh, euh, assez euh, euh, nébuleux, euh, donc, euh, donc, pas super précis. Donc, je ne suis pas sûr, mais euh, on pourrait en parler euh, à la limite. Euh, pour, pour, et, et, et alors aussi pour euh, la violence intolérable, euh, oui, bien sûr, mais puis il y a aussi la cruauté euh, euh, bien usée, mal usée, euh, tout, tout, tout le discours par rapport au, euh, au problème de la criminalité. Donc, il, il y a, je comprends ça comme, comme, des, comme, des, forces, comme des formes rhétoriques. Ce ne sont pas tous des, des, des concepts... Euh, articulé, bien différencié, euh, réaliste, si tu veux, mais, mais euh, je pense qu'il faut les comprendre comme une, une, une rhétorique de la violence qui est articulée dans le prince et, et la lire à partir, à partir de ce moment. Euh, je pense surtout à la lecture de, de, de Vicky Kahn et sa, sa compréhension d'Agathoclès à partir de, euh, du chapitre 7. Euh, mais mais j'ai l'impression que... Euh, donc... Euh, pour les temps de la conjoncture, oui, euh, il, y a une, il y a une temps pour la violence, il y a une temps pour, euh, un temps pour certaines formes de la violence, euh, certaines euh, euh, formations euh, qui sont propres à, à, à un temps bien défini. Et c'est pour ça que l'idée de la violence comme euh, instrument qu'on peut transposer d'un endroit à un autre me paraît... Euh, euh, me paraît pas convaincante. Euh, donc, euh, donc, oui, merci. Merci encore, euh, Yves.